to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Howdy, guys. How's it going? Good. Hey, man. Good. Good to be back on. Good. Great to be with you guys. Well, our intro question for today, since we want our listeners to remember that we're actually real people too, albeit very Western Gentiles, as is evidenced by this question, what would be the sport you would compete in if you were in the Olympics? John, let's start with you. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, bro. (laughs) I I have no idea. Don't, Don't they have disc golf or something? (laughs) <laughs> I haven't watched the Olympics at all. I don't even, I don't, I, I'm clueless, bro. You got to do something else. <laughs> bowling, like something. <laughs> I don't think there's bowling in the Olympics. You... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. What about you, Bill? <laughs> um, the The only sport that I actually am involved in is soccer. I coach soccer. I play soccer with old people once a week. So uh, there we go. I'll say I'd say soccer. But, there we but, go. But twenty years ago, you know, twenty twenty five right. years ago. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, yeah, man, we, we haven't had much time watching the Olympics, uh, and I, I'm not uh, super uh, athletic. I used to play ball in in high school and college basketball, but that's about it. There we go. There okay, go. I mean that's fair. That's fair, and I would. I would easily throw in cycling. Um, there is all sorts of kinds of cycling in the Olympics. So that's what I would do just because that's what I already do and enjoy that. So there we go. You are a cycler. You are. You're a beast. A cycler. <laughs> that's good. Well, listeners, thanks again for joining us for another episode. Here in our second season, we've been interviewing guests who've understood and are living out this first century Jewish apocalyptic gospel, this good news focused on the return of Jesus, the coming kingdom of God, the day of judgment, etc. And as you probably know by now, in the second season of our show, we haven't really been directly working through biblical passages like we did in our entire first season, but we've been interviewing guests who've held to this gospel, and we've really hoped that their stories, uh, their testimonies, that they've encouraged you, that in the midst of the mundaneness of life and trials and challenges and ups and downs, that their words and their witness have caused you to once again take this apocalyptic gospel seriously. So, In our last episode, we did a review of the four interviews in our last block, and today we want to introduce you to two amazing men of God, Seth Roche and Daniel Jordan. Seth and his precious wife, Ashish, along with their four children, serve Jesus full-time, currently in the United States, and uh, they're currently in Cleveland, Tennessee area, uh, with a team of dedicated Jesus-loving seekers to train disciples to be obedient to the Great Commission. They're living for the age to come, and they've set their hope in the return of Christ and Daniel Jordan and his wife, Natasha. They achieved the American dream, but walked away from it almost two years ago to pursue a radical lifestyle of following Jesus and preaching the gospel. And now they're traveling across the Russian-speaking world, training disciples and teaching them obedience to the gospel and the cost of following Jesus. So guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad, very glad to be here. It's very good to be here. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listeners, I know these guys are going to stir you, so um, it's great to be with you this morning. Seth, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Let's start with you, man. Yeah. Um, I grew up in, uh, in in Michigan, or northern Indiana, and then Michigan, second part of my life, uh, my teenage life. And uh, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents, they met at a uh, Glory Barn revival in northern Indiana in the 70s, quickly got married. And, um, and I'm the oldest of three, um, and around 10, 11, um, my parents got divorced and, uh, you know, we had moved up to Michigan and at that time I was, a, I was getting into skateboarding and, and my, uh, my life just, um, started taking a, a, a wrong turn. Um, I, my, my mom got remarried and I, I lost my identity. I, I, I loved Jesus as a kid. Um, but I just had all kinds of emotion, anger and just different things. I didn't know who I was and I gravitated towards the wrong crowd. So as a teenager, I got in a lot of trouble. Um, 
I got into drugs and things like that. But my mom was a praying mom. She's a prayer warrior. Um, she used to take my blankets and pillows to the intercessory women's prayer group and anoint them with oil <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. And, <laughs> and awesome. uh, I always seemed to get caught more than my friends, you know. And so, you know, God was after me. When I was 17, I was I was actually arrested and I was in jail. And uh, a couple of days there, I um, God spoke to my heart and said that he let me get arrested. Otherwise, I was going to go to hell because of the way I was I was headed, I was really, really out there and um god had mercy on me and my heart i broke I, I started weeping and just thanking the lord and started seeking him and um by god's grace i actually you know not to tell the whole story but i got sentenced out of state to minnesota teen challenge um when i was 17 18 and that was an amazing time in my life um but you know i was just like lord you saved my life. My life's not mine anymore. And I want to, I want to live up to this, this great mercy that you've shown me. And, um, you know, that led me down quite a journey the last 25 years. And, uh, you know, uh, he put a love of the truth in my heart. And, um, so I was always searching and seeking and reading and a part of this and a part of that. And, um, yeah, so I've, I, uh, got got involved with uh, a man who became my father-in-law. I married his oldest daughter. He was, he discipled me for a little while. And, uh, you know, I was outside of the institutional church system for probably the last 20 years. Although um, I've had great relationships with different uh, saints and different ones in and out of church system. And um, anyhow, God has just had a hold of my life and I've been, just trying to follow him, trying to seek him, trying to obey him, uh, and and try to understand the truth. And uh, it's been it's been quite a quite an up and down journey. So yeah, in the last four or five years, um, I've been uh, really on this new phase, of this journey, and um, all the callings and all the words and all the things that God has spoken um, is starting to kind of come alive uh, in, in in my heart, um, and. I was really seeking the Lord about um, the return of Christ. And I, for a while there, I started thinking, maybe it's going to be different than we think. You know, maybe, um, you know, just like they thought the first coming of Christ, you know, that, that when Christ came as, as a conquering, they, they were expecting a conquering king, and yet he came as a, as a suffering servant. I was like, maybe the second coming is going to be different than what we think as well, you know. But then I got a hold of a uh, heavenly man. I read that. And I realized that the truth is the truth universal. And when, when, um, when our brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering for the Lord's sake, uh, and they read the scriptures, they're going through tribulation. You know, I grew up kind of pre-trib, and I just realized that, um, you know, there's a whole nother uh, way of, of seeing the scriptures that we need to look at. Um, I was introduced to Art Katz, and, um, and his, his preaching really impacted me. And so I started seeking about the sufferings of Christ in this, in this age and carrying on the ministry of the Lamb of God. And I don't even know what search terms I, I put in, but I found John's website. And, and then uh, my friend Daniel here, um, he was on a very similar journey and, and found some of the similar things. And he actually bought me John's book. Uh, three years ago for Christmas um, uh, at that same time. And so it was like, God was trying to get, get my attention. And then I went to this conference in Ohio uh, a couple of years ago, and that's where um, uh, John showed up there. I met uh, him, Mark Tuzzolino, Mark Clafter, and different ones. And so I just started this journey. Um, I got connected with Bill started asking questions, started, uh, you know, on the DTN network, started listening to the courses on biblical theology and, and worldview and all these things. And there was a moment when the reality of the day of the Lord, the reality of, of just the big picture came alive to me. And for me, I'm a, I'm a big picture guy. I need to see the big picture. And all of a sudden the Bible started making more sense and it just, it wasn't so far apart. And so, so you know, mystical and just so out there, it was actually starting to make sense. And it says what it means. And it gave me such a strength in my heart. And, um, and it was at that time as well that um, 
I got invited to come to uh, to be a part part of this school uh, evangelism training school with um, the Last Reformation, and that started a whole new journey, which we can talk about uh, in a little bit. Yeah, man, that is awesome. That is awesome, Daniel. Tell us about yourself, man. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me. First, it's uh, nice to be here with you all. Uh, you know, my story is that uh, I grew up as a preacher's kid. You know, in a Christian home. Uh, I grew up in uh, in church, in fellowship, um, and I love Jesus. And uh, I never had the uh, I never had the bad uh, wayward uh, you know history that uh, that Seth talked about. Uh, I never went astray, um, but I know that I, I grew up knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, but my uh, life-changing experience happened in college when I joined uh, the Chi Alpha campus ministry, and and uh, they um, introduced me to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is something that was lacking in my uh, denomination growing up. Uh, I had never heard about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and uh, never heard anyone speak in tongues. And I was really hungry for that. I was like, man, I can't believe this is out there. I can't believe this is real. And uh, I, I just went after it. I went after it hard. And I said, Lord, I need this. I want this. This promise is for me. You know, why am I missing this? And uh, yeah, I, I I think I got prayed for uh, many times. I embarrassed myself going down the aisle. <laughs> I uh, really wanted the Lord. And uh, and it happened. Um in a very radical way in my own room uh, when I was just seeking God. And I said, Lord, if, if you know, I, I read to the Lord every instance in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit was poured out. And I said, Lord, I'm no different from any of these people. And I said, Lord, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, you're going to fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. And that's what happened. I said, one, two, when I said three, a wind came into my room and touched my face. And, um, and I just got, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoken tongues. And that, that, that story, that event, that event just changed my life. Um, I began to move in the gifts. I began to, um, uh, just uh, a new relationship began with me, with, with the Lord. And uh, it, it was amazing. Of course, in college, you know, we were poor and, and uh, reckless. And I didn't understand at the time how good that was for the gospel, but you can just uh, you know, just trust God and because you had nothing else to lean on, you know, and, uh, and that was, uh, of course we had, we, we had community. We had, we had, uh, some things that we, I began seeking much later in life. Looking back, I didn't re realize how much, how much we had it going, but, I eventually, um, you know, got married, you know, I graduated, got married, and, and then I began going to church. And that's when things began to stall. And yeah, then a, just a deep frustration began to set in for me. You know, I think I was in church for four years and and just not much happening and no fruit, you know. And the thing I, I, I tell people, how could, you know, when I preach the gospel now, is so how could someone like me who has encountered the Holy Spirit in such a radical way, uh, almost like the book of Acts chapter two, how could someone like me go through such a time of fruitlessness and, and, and a time of um, uh, you're such barrenness, you know? And uh, I didn't know what, what, what was wrong. And, but that point right there, um, one day I was on stage and I, you know, I, was, a, I was a keyboard player. And uh, this thought came, like a drop of revelation came to me. And the thought was, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And I never thought that before. There's something wrong about what we're doing in church, how we're doing it. I don't know what it was. And, and for the first time, I thought, I have to find out what's going on. And I began to seek the Lord. I began to seek God. And, you know, before that, it never really occurred to me that I would just assume that, all the churches I was a part of were, you know, similar to the New Testament churches. And I didn't really know how different the witness of the early church was, the, their message, their organization, the way they meet, everything about it. 
And for me, and that's a long time ago, guys, that's, we're talking 2007, you know, um, when I began to seek God, like, Lord, something is not right. And we stepped out of traditional Christian, of tradi- traditional Christianity, you know, and uh, I remember God say, saying to me clearly, this is one of those times when, you know, God, you know, God uh, spoke and he says, I'm calling you to a different work with a different foundation. And, um, I had no idea. I didn't know anything about house churches. I had not read any book about house church or, 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 or the apocalyptic gospel, no less, you know, I don't know anything about it, all, any of that, but that point of stepping out in faith and seeking him uh, was so critical in my life. I eventually uh, became part of the house church movement because I thought the answer is house church. You know, we have to go back to how it was in the in the book of Acts and we need to have go back to plurality of eldership and we need to go back to simplicity and face-to-face community. And I thought that's the answer. And we did have, in fact, Seth and I were actually, our, our, our journeys intersected at that point and we had an amazing a house church experience together where we witnessed the planting of a church from scratch in, in Florida. Uh, but after three years, I have to say that, yeah, we had amazing meetings, but no one got saved. No one got baptized. No one got filled with the Holy spirit. No one got healed. And it was just a church about us. And I realized that having the right structure, having the right organization is not enough. There was, I never realized there was something, something so much um, deeper that was missing which is the message itself. The content of the gospel message was was off. And uh, and in fact, also our our lives were with, was without power. There was no power to our to what we were doing. And so I my journey had to continue, you know, and that was very discouraging for me because I thought if I'm not if if traditional Christianity is not a home for me and and the now the house church movement is not is no home for me what's where do I move forward? Where do I go? And, you know, what is the way forward? And it was, uh, the, uh, the, the message of, uh, the, the day of the Lord and, um, the two age, uh, worldview came to my attention about maybe three years ago. And, uh, and it really put, um, put everything in. It was like the one thing that put everything in perspective, you know, it tied everything together, I guess is what, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but for us, the critical thing is in the midst of the journey and the seeking, and we were still, we didn't know how much we were enslaved to the American lifestyle that we were still, um, you know, uh, uh, having careers, having, you know, very time consuming careers, uh, you know, um, and kids and baseball schedules and ice skating schedules. And, and we didn't know how, how that, that the word of God had no room for us to really room in our lives, to really bear to grow and, and to bear fruit. And in the midst of the, uh, yeah, again, seeking God and, and following him, we realized that we were still living for ourselves. And that was the ultimate re- revelation. It's not just knowing what the right s- church structure is, or even what the right message was. The last piece for us and our family was, Daniel, there's something wrong with you. You're still living for yourself. And that's when I, you know, I think we, uh, you know, came into uh, uh, a relationship with the last Reformation. And I remember, I think you guys know Torben, son of God. And we were listening to, to a message and he said, there are two things that are keeping you from following Jesus, your house and your career. And my wife and I looked at each other and we, we stared at each other for like 30 seconds. And it was the longest 30 seconds of my life. We knew that something had us. And we just, at, from that point, we said, that's it. I told her, do you want this life? It's nice, comfortable life. Do you want it? She said, no. And we began to sell things. We began to, we sold a couple of properties. We had rental properties that we sold. We gave things away, our couch, our dining room table, our various possessions, and it's time right now to follow Jesus full on and, and proclaim this message that, um, that Jesus is not only Savior. He didn't only come the first time. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. The time is short. And there was a burning uh, urgency now that was uh, uh, in our hearts. And uh, of course, now that we've also aged, <laughs> 
You know, we're not young. It's not Chi Alpha anymore. You know, it's, this is guys, we're talking about 20 years later, okay? You know, so the urgency isn't just uh, something, it's real for us, you know? And, uh, and so we, uh, yeah, we took the step of faith. We quit our, our jobs and uh, at least the time consuming ones. Um, my wife still has an online job that helps us. Uh, and uh, now we're, we're traveling in the Russian speaking world and we're committed to really communicating um, about, you know, what it means to follow Jesus, the cost that it takes to follow Jesus, that it is costly and that you cannot serve God and, and mammon, like Jesus says. And, um, and the time is short and to really articulate and paint um, the picture of what is to come, you know, the coming kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ and the glories that is to come. And that this life as it stands is passing away in its current form. And uh, now we're making disciples. And since we've done that, and, you know, two years ago, we've seen more fruit than we've seen in the previous 20 years. Mm. We've seen miracles, we've seen healings, we've seen, we've cast out demons, we've, uh, and we've seen repentance, which is always the, the greatest fruit for me, is seeing people repent and confess their sins and kneel down at the cross of Jesus Christ. And um, yeah, now we just keep going, you know. That's awesome, man. Uh, could you guys maybe just give for the listeners that haven't aren't familiar with Torben and the Last Reformation? I know you know that's been uh, you guys have been involved in the past with them, and if you could just kind of give a little intro for our listeners of Torben and his ministry, he's a extremely provoking man. Um, we, we love Torben and love a gift of faith that he imparts. Yeah. Um, Torben is a man on a mission. I mean, um, I, I, he lives, I believe with this two age framework, even though maybe not have been exposed to the full apocalyptic gospel as we're talking about here, but he's living it out with that urgency that Paul had that, that, you know, the early disciples had. And, um, and and I don't know how, how he does it. He he moves at a speed and a pace that, it, like he really believes Jesus is going to come back soon. And so it is very provoking. And um, Daniel and I both got involved. Um, actually, Daniel invited me to a kickstart in December 2019, and um, that's where I met Torvin and shared some of my story about organic church and things like that where daniel and i met and that really started a relationship and then we my family and i went to a school in march in north carolina uh, of 2020 and um a weekend uh there's a there's one of the messages that uh torben does at these kickstarts at the end of it it's called uh four grounds you know the four soils and are we going to be the fourth soil? It's, it's you know, our choice. Basically, it's a call to discipleship. It's a call to surrender all to Christ. And um, historically, at that time, um, maybe if his wife's there, she'll come up and sing a song, uh, this, this, this song from the Lord, and the Spirit of God moves so powerfully. And I know in that meeting, uh, Daniel was there. We were both there together. Um, and... Uh, the whole place, everyone's on their face, crying out to God. The fear of the Lord is there. The spirit of God is moving. There was tongues and interpretation. There's a couple hundred people there. And I know my wife and I were just on our faces weeping and, and just the Lord was calling us all in, all in. And, um, and from there, we just, uh, we were, we went for a three week school and this was right at height of COVID, you know, March, 2020. And then they also did a two month school and we, we decided to, uh, we felt the Lord wanted us to join that, uh, continue on. Um, but that came at a cost, you know, anytime we want to follow the Lord to fully or follow the Lord to the next step, that always has a cost involved. Um, but I want to say it's worth it. We have to realize that this present age is truly passing away. And this gospel, this apocalyptic gospel, it, in my opinion, it for me, anyways, it has dislodged me from this present age. It has, it has like taken me out of 
this present age and set my eyes on the age to come, set my eyes on Christ. And so, and it puts you at a place where you have to fully trust him. Um, and so we had a decision to make. Um, it was between our house and job and all that kind of stuff if we wanted to continue. And at the time I worked for my dad, helped manage his business. And um, I, uh, he basically said, you, you, uh, you can stay at the school for two months if you want, but you're going to give up your job because, you know. And so we, we had to do that because God spoke so clearly to us. And that began a journey. Um, we had no assurances, but uh, eventually we were invited to, to help uh, with the next school and um, became part of the leadership and one of the teachers. And, uh, and it's just been, um, I'll tell you what, one thing I've noticed with, um, with TLR is they can take someone who is the most introverted, non-evangelistic person, and you get in that environment and you become evangelistic. Um, you start to see God work through your life. And that's the beautiful thing that, that this is for everybody, not just a special few. We don't have to wait for some special anointing, some special calling, some special gifting. When God said go to preach the gospel, do the work of an evangelist, pray for the sick, you know, all these things, that, that's for all of us. And God is more than willing to back up and be there with you if we just would press through a little, little more than we're used to. And that's where we begin seeing the fruit. When you press in, you step out and, and you continue to go on. And so we've seen uh, a lot of that happen in, in the last year. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, we, I don't think, I don't know anyone that's trained more uh, disciples than Torben as far as um, teaching people how to, how to, how to, get out of the comfort zone, preach the gospel on the streets and, uh, and experience healing. You know, people go out and they actually begin to do the works of Jesus. Um, and uh, the, the heart of, of the message uh, for, for Torbert and the Last Reformation is really, is the response to the gospel that they have it so right to repent, be water baptized for the remission of your sins and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the, the quality of the conversions is so much higher because now they focus on repentance where, where people don't just say a sinner's prayer. There's a focus on confession, on coming clean, on disclosing deeds of darkness, on, on disclosing um, you know, sinful acts. Not that we dig into people's pasts too much, but we, you know, when you ask someone, what do you need to confess or what have you done? Most people have two or three things that come up right away. And those are the things that, that God's after. And then we want to baptize them. You know, uh, I think um, I think the last reformation has done uh, has given the body of Christ a lot in to recover some of that. You know, that 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 critical piece. And um, and of course, you know, it's just another part of our journey. And I, I thank God for it. And um, and we want to see. You know, we're now teaching others. Uh, now I'm hoping the young, the next generation can learn those things much sooner and quicker than than we did, um, and that gives us a lot of joy. Yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to say one thing. Also, I've learned um, is it, it's messy. It's messy, and uh, I think one reason Torben is getting a lot of results is he's not afraid of the mess. Um, me personally, I like things a little more clean. I like to do things a little more orderly. But you know what? we need guys like Torben that will go out there and just push forward and let God take care of the mess part. And we do it our best, but he, he, he's a man of integrity. He's a man of faith. Um, I know, him, you know, we're, fr we're personal friends with him and I know he gets a lot of flack and things like that. And, and, you know, we're not here to, uh, to necessarily just talk about him, but I wanted to say he's been a blessing to us and, um, He's not afraid of the mess. And I want to encourage us all, don't be afraid of the mess. Like it, following God is, I mean, you look at the book of Acts, you look at the, the letters to the churches, there's mess. And, um, you know, a lot of times we want to have all our systematic theology all figured out 100% perfect, and then we'll go do something for the Lord. I'm telling you, get out there, learn, do it, and, and, and God will teach you, God will help you, and, and that's, that's the main thing. Yeah, for any of you guys, for our listeners, uh, we encourage you to, uh, to go on the Last Reformation website or on YouTube and watch their 
videos, very provoking and awesome. Uh, just stuff on the street, praying for people for healing and deliverance. So good, man. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah. I, I have probably watched, I've probably watched the last reformation, the life 10 times. It's so powerful. So great. Um, well guys, that's awesome. I really appreciate all that. I, I really appreciate Torben a lot as well. Um, so my question is, I love hearing kind of the background and all the different uh, ways the Lord has led you guys personally over the years. Um, how specifically has the gospel focused on the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus? How has that affected the way you do life or the way you do ministry. Yeah. I mean, as I mentioned a little earlier is that we could not be, there was an effective in our couldn't the current lifestyle that we were living. There is a, an urgency that came upon us that uh, Jesus is coming back soon. We're going to stand before him and give an account of every word uh, and, and deed and that he expects fruit. And the fact that we haven't yet attained to the resurrection from the dead. And this is, you know, something that is a problem really when uh, really, I think most Christians, including us for many years, would consider themselves saved or that they have already, in other words, they already, you know, attained. Whereas in the Bible, salvation is spoken of in the present tense also and also in the future tense. So salvation is more than just what happened in the past. And so for me now, the understanding that is just came to life that we haven't yet attained to the resurrection from the dead. You know, we, we have still ways to go, uh, which means that our time is short. So for us, uh, we had to pay off our debts. We had to, we, we had to count the costs and it took us sadly to say, guys, it took us three years to pay things off, to get ready, to really be able to make, make a step that, where we're free and we wouldn't, have, we, we wouldn't look back to our old life. And, um, and so we, and so that's why we had to quit our jobs, you know, and, and uh, we or, or change our jobs to something m more simple and, and that would allow us to travel, that will allow us to, to be, uh, spend more time uh, discipling people, more time preaching the gospel. And, uh, and our, our lives, my life is in Florida. Like that's my life. And, and I'm not there. Cause I, cause I left it. So, and now everything about my life is not the, is not the house and the career and, and, and things like that. And so it, it came at a, it's very real for us. Um, you know, the cost, uh, to follow Jesus and, um, and to proclaim this message to, to others, the fact that, uh, how, how temporal this life really is. Uh, and now that's, that's a core message for us. And now our disciples go on the streets and they, they, they say to people, Jesus is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Are you ready? And um, uh, yeah. Yeah. we get a lot of joy from that. That's awesome, man. That's, that's great, Daniel. Um, Seth, how about you, man? Same question. Like, how is the gospel specifically realizing how focused it actually was on the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus? How has that really grabbed you and your family? Yeah, it, it's it's given me context and perspective um, for everything we're doing, um, and it's also um, I was I was sharing this with Daniel yesterday when we were talking a little bit how um, realizing that the closer we get to that day as believers, that we have to be have to it said uh, Paul Peter said arm yourselves with a mind to suffer. And that if we're going to live a life in this age that is godly, uh, that is righteous, that we will suffer for his namesake. And it's probably not going to get easier as we go forward. Um, but the reality that there is a day, there is light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a day that the Lord has fixed, that he will come and not only bring salvation for the righteous and bring restoration for for those that are waiting upon him, but he's going to bring judgment. He's going to, he's going to rid the world of wickedness and oppression and all those things. And so, as Paul said, the glories that 
are to be revealed cannot be compared to the light afflictions we're facing now. And of course, his light afflictions are nothing like anything we've faced yet. But um, so it puts into perspective what I go through every day. So if I have stress, if I don't know how, you know, where I'm going to, how I'm going to pay for this or where I'm going to go here or just, you know, internal, you know, just the, the stresses of life or the difficulties of, of trying to follow Jesus, it really, it doesn't, it, it, it's not as um, consuming as it used to be. It's not as crippling as it used to be um, because I realize this is nothing compared to what is going to come and both the good and the bad, you know what I mean? So both the suffering and the glory yet to be revealed. And so I'm pressing forward to that day. And I've got in my heart and my mind, the reality that I need to be prepared to suffer for his namesake, but I am looking for, I am gripped by the hope of resurrection. I am gripped by the hope that I'm going to see his face one day and I'm going to be like him because I'm going to see him as he is. And, and that fills my heart with strength to, to make the hard decisions every day to trust him in my weakness, to trust him uh, when I don't know what to do. I don't know what the next move is. There's like, uh, you know, when he's saying step out on the water and you don't know if, if it's going to, if you're going to sink or if you're going to stand, you know that he's faithful. And so, you know, it's just really encouraged me to, to just be s- strong in the Lord and to follow him. And that has affected the way that um, I relate with my wife. I relate with my kids. This message has actually gives context to all it, it, it rounds out and it brings the foundation into a strength, strengthening place. So repentance has a context for the day of the Lord. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything is in light of that day. And so um, it, we have seen it transforms uh, students and, and transform our own lives. And, and it's just been really powerful in, in having the big picture and putting things in their proper perspective. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, you know, while you're talking, I just had the, the phrase stretch thin for Jesus. And, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, particularly the last five years, we've just felt completely stretched to beyond our own ability to cope on so many levels. And uh, even this summer, our trip back to the States and then coming back and me bringing half the kids and my wife and being in the States still. And, uh, but it's all good. You know, what, what, what are we trying to store up for? And if we're completely stretched thin and left with nothing at the end of this thing, there's eternal glory that is multiplied on the other side. And so it, it really, it does. Uh, I really identify with that. Just being able to, to cope with, uh, one thing after another being compounded on end and, uh, and, uh, you just keep pressing forward <laughs> and don't sweat it because, uh, there's an eternal weight of glory on the other side. That's awesome, man. Uh, so I know you guys have like so many stories, just awesome stories, you know, that I've talked to you guys about. Um, can you guys share just a, a couple quick stories on how you've seen, you know, the gospel, the death of the Messiah in light of the return of the Messiah and the resurrection and eternal life, how that's borne fruit in other disciples, stories of what, how the Lord has confirmed this gospel, things like that. <laughs> Yeah, um, I could share just uh, our, we did a big event and we had like over 130 people from all over Russia that came and, and, and it's the time where, where the people that come are, are generally seeking God, like they, they're, they're coming for healing, they're coming for, uh, they've seen the videos and, you know, I preach the gospel, you know, strong and it's coming out of the message now. It's just oozing out of us, out of me, as far as the, uh, the Jesus coming back to judge the living and the dead, and and uh, the the you know immortality came through through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, you know when I talked about the coming wrath of God and and the judgment, uh, and I call people to repentance, and uh, you would not believe. And I said, if you haven't forgiven somebody right now if there's bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart god's not going to forgive you on that day 
And people were start picking up their phones and calling people to ask for forgiveness. While I was preaching, people were picking up their phones, calling people. They were coming up front. They are bowing down and uh, uh, they confessing their sins. Uh, we ended up baptizing uh, on that day about 18 people. And because it was so cold in Russia, it was snowy outside. I said, Lord, how am I going to baptize these people? And, uh, and uh, I went ahead and purchased a, 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 a 360 liter garbage barrel. And, um, and we, ba- we baptized people in a garbage barrel. And I proclaimed it. I'm the, pr- proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The fear of God came. And, and I said, guys, you got to go back to your neighbors and you're going to tell them God cleaned me up in a garbage barrel today. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, you got to awesome. tell them God, God has chosen the, the, weak, the, 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 the uh, weak things of the world to shame the wise. And uh, of course, they came out of the water. We prayed for them for deliverance. We've had several deliverances. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit, every single one of them, <laughs> Receive the Holy Spirit, spoken tongues that day. The, there was such a demonstration of the, and this is something that we've seen. God confirms this message. This message, God confirms, and we've seen healings. Uh, there was this one lady, you know, she came up, she had a skin disease. Her hand was, had almost like bubbles of, or, or dot, dots of, you know, red dots, uh, painful uh, rash of some kind. And she had to buy expensive creams to to keep the pain down. And then she came up to one of our disciples and uh, and he prayed for her. But the interesting thing is that he didn't pray for healing. He prayed for deliverance and something. And then she said she felt something left and she fell down. She didn't realize that she that a demon came out. Uh, well, no, she she saw that she realized that something came out, but she realized that she was healed. And then a few days later, um, she woke up two days later and there was her skin has been completely restored. And then when I heard this story, I thought, I want to, it's frustrating because we get a lot of testimonies and, and most of them we can't confirm because people leave. We can't capture on video or, or I mean, uh, sometimes. So I said, let me find this lady. Who is she? What's her name? I called her and I said, is this real? Did this happen? And she said, yes. I said, send me pictures. Do you have it before and after? And she did. And guys, you should see the picture. From one hand, the hand on one side is bubbly, red, and the on the, on the other picture is completely healed. And, and and this is like, you know, it's not like we we did this. One of our disciples did it, you know. Um, and that's that's great. That's just one of many. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I just say, you know, it, in my early days when I first got saved, I, I, I was very eager. I would go out, share the gospel, talk to anybody. And things like that. But over time and, you know, and being in, in church and stuff, you get kind of, I, I just became more dormant, I would say, but always had that faith in my heart. And and the thing that in the last couple of years, I just, you know what, you don't have to have it all figured out. I don't have to have, you know, this special level of faith or whatever. You just got to go. And, and, and I got this uh, phrase that I started using is you, you never know till you go. You never know till you go because so many times you go out and you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you encounter people, you see people suffering, people's hurting, and you pray with them and you see that God is the same God who loves you. He loves them and he's more than willing to do things. And for a long time, I was, I was struggling like, well, what if, what if nothing happens? I don't want to make God look bad. I don't want to look bad either, you know? Um, and I would say being in this environment with the TLR and everything, it totally took that out of, out of my mind because I realized it's about obedience and it's God's job to do everything. And so if we will just make ourselves available and just go and, and show the love of God and have simple childlike faith that God will do what only he can do and you, you grow and things like that. And so, but as far, as far as this message um, and I shared this with you before, Bill, uh, last December I was, um, teaching, uh, at, at a school and one of the schools and I was teaching on the whole, I had three hours to teach on the Holy spirit. And, uh, and so the, after the first half, um, I, I couldn't, I can't help, but always shift to the day of the Lord. Like everything I talk about now, it goes to there, you know, it's just, I can't help it because it's so alive, you know? 
And so I started talking about the need for the Holy Spirit. If we want to have a hope of the resurrection, we need the down payment. We need the first fruits in us, you know, and just uh, to be a witness and all these different things and started talking about the resurrection of the dead and highlighting the day of the Lord and highlighting the, these things. And there was this uh, sister there who, um, I mean, growing up in church, she heard about it, but never was the resurrection of the dead, never was the return of Christ like this ever highlighted. And it did something in her. It gave her a living hope. And she started weeping in class. And she said, she said, I just got to testify that this, this has changed my life. And this simple gospel message. And she's like, I'm, I'm doing everything I can right now not to ugly cry. Like, I have been gripped by the reality of the hope of, of this gospel. And, um, and she left there to, to go to her room after class. And uh, God was doing something in her, very supernatural, that no one prayed for her, nothing. And what the way she described it was she felt like there was this, this split in her. I don't know if it's like how the word of God divides between soul and spirit or whatever, how, how you break it down. But she said she was feeling like dirty. And so she wanted to take a shower. And, um, but then she said, the Lord said, no, I want you to sit with me. She started thinking about the message and everything. And she started weeping again. And then all of a sudden she said, she started to um, a cough or whatever. And, sh- and a spirit left her. Uh, a, a, a spirit left her in this depression and these things that she had been battling with had totally left her. And, and this hope filled her heart. Um, and another thing that happened at the same time was she had been seeking prayer for healing, uh, for, for hormonal things, something with her body, something that she could tell a difference or, and she got healed right then. Um, and it, it, so she got delivered and healed in response to the message and no one prayed for her, just the hope of the gospel. And she came back excited later that day and told me about it. And I was just like, wow, uh, it, it encouraged me so much. And it just confirmed in my heart that, yes, this is what we need to be preaching. We need to anchor people's hearts in the blessed hope, the hope to come, the return of Christ. Man. That's, I love that story. I've shared that with a number of people. A story about the that lady and uh, at the school. So, man, that's super encouraging. And um, <clears throat> so, let me let me just ask a final question here. Um, you know, because the the point of this is you guys have ingested a lot of the gospel, so to speak. And as you said, doesn't mean that all your T's are crossed and your I's dotted, but you've ingested a lot of the implications. You've eaten the scroll to some degree, so to speak. And uh, so that said, based on where you're at in the journey, um, what are a couple of ways that you guys would each challenge or encourage those who are listening to stay the course with the gospel. I really would encourage everyone to take inventory of their lives first um, and ask this question, what am I serving? Uh, I just have to go back to the fact that everything opens up once we carry, deny ourselves and carry the cross and, and follow Jesus. And I think that it's so hard to know what that looks like because for me, I've had so little example of, of people who've done that. They've typically been, Oh, just missionaries or something, or like, you know, the, you know, I never saw it as a call of every single believer, every single disciple to die to him, to, to himself and to follow, you know, uh, Christ. Um, I, I would say maybe that's another thing that we gained from the last reformation is that we've seen people, uh, you know, live that live out this radical lifestyle yeah daniel i was speaking to a group last week and it was just impressing me how real the american dream is an eschatology for multitudes of people that the american dream is the dominant eschatology of the west not only among unbelievers but also believers it is their end that drives them to get out of bed. It shapes their discipleship. Everything they do in life is shaped by this eschatology. 
of building and having some idealistic uh, existence or comfortable or whatever that end kind of dominates people without them even really realizing it. And I think it is something I appreciate your testimony because I think it is something that people need to be shaken out of. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not just for a few people to be shaken out of. It is for the church at large to be shaken out of. And it takes a greater eschatology. It takes an eschatology oriented around Jesus and angels and fire, I think, to really shake people out of it. So that's awesome, man. Just appreciate your testimony on that. Amen. Amen. How about you, Seth? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, you know, just to, on that note, um, uh, I was at a meeting at a kickstart sharing, um, just about living this life. And, and I, and I have this term that I use, I realized that everyone there is eager to follow the Lord, eager to be fruitful, eager to, to say, yeah, yes, I want to be a disciple. I want to be all in and everything like that. And yet I was keenly aware that the American dream it's like one of those heavy blankets, you know, those, those weighted blankets, and it's just weighing on people. It's, it's literally covering them, and they don't even realize it. We, we grow up deceived. We, we grow up deceived. We're coming out of deception into the light, right? And so um, many people, you know, and, and many of us in many ways, we don't realize how ingrained this world, the world does a really good job of offering an alternative, a security, uh, a hope, and all these different things. And we are literally programmed from day one to serve that system, to live for that system. And then we come into the gospel and God does something in our hearts and he changes us. And then we come into the 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 grit of uh, the implications of the gospel and how ultimate they are and how eternal they are. And, and then you start coming into, you're either going to really lay hold of this gospel and let it shape you and form you at no co- at any cost, no matter the cost, or you're going to compromise it, change it, water it down, make it something else so that you can have both the world and this hope of the age to come. And Jesus didn't do that. The apostles didn't do that. You know, we have to step back, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and look at the scriptures afresh and anew in light of the day of the Lord, in light of what it's been saying from beginning to end, and realize that this isn't going to change. This message is not going to change. Either we are going to change and be conformed to the image of Christ, or we are going to uh, suffer the consequences. And as, as John just mentioned in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, that scripture has come alive to me, verse 5 and 6 and on, that he's coming to judge the unbelievers and those who do not obey the gospel of God. And that's a sobering, sobering reality. Um, this is not a game. This is truth. This is reality. This is life. And so God, it says that um, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I want to trust him each day. I want to learn to trust him more and um, without opportunity, without actually being in a position where you have to, that he has to come through. Then it's just something you, you believe you haven't put the test and um, this belief, you know, according to the, the, the Hebrew understanding, it includes action. Faith includes action. They are not separate. They are one and the same faith and action go together. And so obedience is the way forward to the gospel. And thank God for his Holy Spirit, because when we are weak, he is strong. He has made himself available abundantly. And the thing that I've been coming to reality to and grips with is the calling, living this life, the trajectory that I'm on. Oh, I can't do this. (laughs) This is beyond me. And Lord, you You've got to, you've got to be my life. You've got to be my all. You've got to be my everything. Um, And I don't want to shy back. I don't want to take shortcuts anymore. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. Please give me hunger for you. Grip my heart for more of you, Lord. I need you. I need you. I need you. That's my prayer. And um, God is, he loves to answer that prayer. He's, he, the goodness of God, he is not holding himself back. He's given us everything 
pertaining to life and godliness. And so he's not trying to hold anything back from us. Yeah. Yeah, guys, thanks for jumping on with us today. Listeners, we hope this has been provoking and encouraging to you, uh, for you to actually get out there on the streets to just trust the Holy Spirit. To, you know, as you said, Seth, faith includes action to actually get out there. Obedience is the way forward because this gospel is too precious and the hope that we have is too glorious to pass up, <laughs> right? The sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So listeners, we hope that this episode has been encouraging to you and uh, we look forward to uh, discussing even more about these things in our up and coming episodes. So thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.